Hi, good evening, everybody. And uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today as part of the GLF Dialogues, uh, to be in conversation with two fantastic writers, uh, Sejal Mehta and Lubaina Bandukwala. Uh, you know that the GLF Dialogues are sessions that we curate around environmental literature. And I think this is perhaps the first one that we're doing uh, that brings a writer of adult books in conversation with a writer of uh, children's books. And, uh, you know, we have picked a theme on which the two of them have excellent books. So Sejal Mehta uh, is a journalist and an editor and has worked and written for uh, the magazine and newspaper industry for over 20 years now, including writing for Lonely Planet magazine, for National Geographic Traveler India, for Nature in Focus. Uh, but she's here today as the author of a wonderful uh, and an exciting book called Superpowers on the Shore, uh, which is about India's uh, coastal, uh, you know, coastal life, the marine ecology of India. And I'm sure she's going to be telling us a lot more exciting things about a book. Lubena Bandukwala is a children's writer, editor and curator of the Pika book, Literature Festival for Kids. She has an exciting book out as well uh, called Coral Woman, which is based on the life of um, this fantastic painter, environmental painter called Uma Mani, who took to diving very, very late in uh, life. I mean, I should not say late in life. Nothing, there's, there's nothing that ever makes anything very late in life, but she did actually take to diving um, uh, you know, when she was in her late 40s and has this remarkable um, sort of life story about uh, trying to save our uh, oceans one dive at a time. Dubaina, has, of course, captured her story in the book, and I'm sure she's going to have many wonderful things to share with us today. So my first question to the two of you ladies, uh, you know, first off, of course, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Sejal, you know, much of our uh, India's 7,500 kilometer long coastline boasts of an unusual diversity of life forms. You know, what is incredible really is how you have imbued these life forms with superpowers. I mean, you know, uh, the creatures that you describe, some of them have the, you know, use a variety of weaponry. Some of them have the ability to hoodwink. Some of them have the ability to disappear on you and even disguise. I mean, how and why did you think of this cinematic sort of approach to uh, a book on uh, India's marine life? Um, so uh, I think uh, there are two, two kind of thought processes on this. One is that uh, I find in history, of course, and in, in fiction and in comics, the rise of superheroes is when something is really tough, right? Then it demands a hero to rise up and sort of um, I found the intertidal space and the more I knew about it and intertidal for anybody who doesn't know is the is the piece of land or actually in some places several kilometers of land that is exposed during low tide and covered during high tide. That's the little part of uh, that's where my stories are structured. That's where I've spent the last you know four years of my life and uh, I found it a very uh, special place and it's a really tough place because if you consider this as a home. Uh, where else would you find, if you had to build a house, a place where there is constant ebb and flow of saline water, twice a day, four times a day, depends where you're situated. There are predators from the shallows, there are predators from the land, there's harsh sunlight, mm -hmm. there's cold moonlight, uh, desiccation. Uh, so much happens here and nowhere else, if you think about it, like the deep forest doesn't have ebb and flow of saline water unless it's an estuary. Deep seas don't have sunlight. So they don't have these problems. So this kind of intertidal zone I found inspires a very specific kind of um, structure. And because it is so special, I it stands to reason that the animals would also be special in that sense, or you know possess some powers to deal with this kind of uh, kingdom. And that kind of that thought process started to roll. And then uh, when I thought about it, I mean, when you think it is, a, it is a, as you said so correctly, it's a spectacle itself, right? The sand you walk on, I mean, it's a remnant of a time that's gone, right? Like boulders that have broken down, coral rubble, uh, poop even, you know, <laughs> fish poop and 
boulders that have like broken down from volcanoes and you know the earth has raised and you know moved from like the dawn of time and it's now settled into this this kind of ecosystem that we see today so when you think about it it's like a secret keeper of so much history so it, to me it was really from the get go a really really special place so i thought that you know if it is so special yahan pe jo rehte honge wo bhi itne special honge so i kind of that's the direction then that took that's really exciting i mean that intertidal space you have made it such a uh, you know the, the the new planet for all of us to sort of inhabit or want to inhabit definitely from yeah. reading uh, superpowers at the show uh, dubaina you know in the telling of the story of uma mani you know who is really trying to do her bit to save our coral reefs uh, you know one dive at a time you know you have woven a love for the oceans for marine creatures for coral reefs and you know and the planet generally in that lovely slim uh, you know book that you have written now tell us you know how did you manage to dive deep in order to get your readers to do the same thing you know um, first of all sejal uh, that's an amazing book I've, i've just started reading it and congratulations i can't wait to be finished with it uh, i think um, like sejal says it's it's all about how much a story excites you and uh, you know then how much you want to share it basically um uma my story first started from a human perspective i enjoyed talking to uma i enjoyed listening to her enthusiasm her simplicity her you know her moment her sort of you know eureka moment where oh, i've discovered the seas you know <laughs> Uh, that sort of thing was like a you know bulb going in my head and i thought gosh you know after all these years you feel like your life has been a routine and suddenly there's a whole new world out there for you you know and i felt like i could go with her on this journey and open up this whole new world for children uh, so there were two things here two parallel stories one is never underestimate how amazing life can be at any stage in your life uh and how you know your potential to open up to it which is what uma did as long as you are enthusiastic and the second thing is uh there are there is so much to be explored on this planet and people talk about coral reefs but when you see it from the eyes of somebody who's you know so childlike you feel you know that all that jaded stuff they talk about teaching and this and that they just numbers you know they're just news uh, headings but this is a really personal journey so you sort of relate to it and i think kids relate to something that people experience and if you can translate that into a relatable experience uh, that sort of works you know so it became two parallel stories for me uma's discovery of herself and her discovery of the oceans which i sort of explored with her and I think now the oceans are my thing, you know. Wow! <laughs> so that's that's how it sort of came about. It really gets you, you know, the ocean. I mean, when you the minute you get acquainted with it, you feel like how how have I lived for so long and not really know so much? No, really. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, it scares me, but I still think it's beautiful. beautiful. it is beautiful like people think i'm a marine biologist and i have to tell them no no i'm just now like it's been just 4 years that i've just randomly walked with these people and then yeah. started to learn but it's yeah. that it's the hook right you you yeah. can't like fathom ke yeah. kya hi like what it's is happening is it unfathomable yeah. quality i think like yeah. right of yeah, the ocean and just... you know reading your books when both your books i mean for for those of us who are absolute creatures of the land you're wondering why wow, what on earth are you doing here we should be <laughs> you know in the seas ourselves really so so one of the uh, you know interesting things about doing this conversation as part of uh, the GLF dialogues was to explore this uh, dynamic of writing on the same theme for two different age groups i mean sejal your book is uh, you know for adults uh, perhaps some young, young adults uh, you know 16 plus can read it and lubaina's is of course clearly for uh, you know young readers 8 9 plus basically so what i want to ask you is that it's often said that the crucial difference between writing for children and uh, writing for adults is that there is no difference at all um you know tell us in the context of adapting the same theme across 
uh, you know, two age groups, and also in the in the context of writing itself, you know, for two different audiences. Either either of you can go. Sejal, would you like to uh, yes, take please. that answer first? Yeah. Um, so, uh, Vidya, I think I've written. Um, the, a book that I'd like to read myself. So something about, I think as I started to approach a story, like I never thought I'd write a science book because I don't read science for pleasure. I don't read nonfiction for pleasure, actually. Okay. I'm an out and out story. Uh, I devour, like I love, um, you know, mysteries and anything that keeps me turning the page. So Thank nonfiction you. for me has always been uh, a battle with uh, the attention span that I have. And I find, uh, but I think this is the book I chose to write because I thought that there might be a lot of people out there, readers like me, who really enjoy information, but maybe serve to them in a way that's easy to understand. And that's where I love what you said about the fact that sometimes there is no difference between when you write for children and you write for adults, because ultimately you want to take a really difficult concept and you want to break it down into a way that everybody understands, which basically I think came easily to me because this is my job. As a, as a writer who mm -hmm. writes about the environment, I think my entire um, thrust is that you understand okay, what is happening. And that is where I feel like a writer's role mm -hmm. is vital because it's not an activist because after I've explained to you what is happening, it's completely on you whether you want to save it or not. It's not yeah, my yeah. place to tell you, right? Because then sometimes when you write for about ecosystems and when you write for and i think lubena might you know agree because she wrote about coral which is you know such a special endangered species in its own self but i think what we want to do and what i wanted to do is just tell people that you sometimes don't even need a ticket to go and go for a wildlife safari you can just take a walk on the beach i think that is the wonder of it and uh, those were the tools i think uh, wonder and delight i think and that so which is why the book sometimes uh and this is something that the my editor Mansi and i had the when she read the first draft and you know she looked at it and she's like you know there are so many things in it there's fiction there's non-fiction there's science uh she said it, it's it's a big i said this is literally me in a book <laughs> because <laughs> this is how I, as a person there is a lot there are i want to you know put everything that I know, but in a way that's easy to understand. So I think it's it's more than anything, I think this was across ages. For me, the idea was it was not age of it, it's I feel, well, to me, the book is age agnostic. I think so. I like I was saying, I have a nine year old niece and then I have, you know, adults who have been reading the book and replying to me about screenshots that they've loved. And I think the stories I thought that the fiction stories will appeal to kids, but they're also appealing to adults. So you are just right in the way that, you know, there was actually no difference. I just tried to make it as simple for people to understand. And I wanted very, very desperately for science to be fun. So I, I think that is why there is so much of this superpowers, because every time somebody said, this is how a cone snail hunts, in my mind, I was like, oh my God, this is like Marvel, Hawkeye. <laughs> or when somebody said, you know, octo camouflage is an octopus, and I was like, oh my God, these are Marvel superheroes who can, you know, like, get invisible. So in my head, because there is so much, and I think for writers, and Lubena will agree, and this is not about children's writers or any other writers, we are all driven by wonder, right? Because what she said, Lubena said something really amazing. When, when there is delight in discovery, it mm. it's very, uh, for us, it's like, this is the, this is our jump off point. When there is delight, discovery, and the whole thing of like, oh my God, I must tell somebody else. And then they will tell somebody else, and they will tell somebody else. And that is why we write, right? We write so that this community becomes like a knowledge sharing space, but it's full of like still delight and wonder. So that was that was the idea. Lovely, lovely. Yeah, uh, yeah you know, I know that's beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> got a nice really insight cool. into your writing process. Lovely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Everything. Uh, <laughs> you know, to, to uh, what I will agree, first of all, um, that the similarities are that you're putting a little piece of you out in every book uh, okay. that can make you slightly vulnerable, you know. Um, but hey, I mean, you got to put it out there if you care enough, you know. Um, I remember I read a review of Coral Woman and somebody is like, I wonder why they even wrote this book. And I'm like, oh, gosh, what does that even mean? <laughs> <laughs> and of all the wonderful, wonderful reviews that were there, that was the one that stayed in my head. And I kept you know, thinking about it. I'm like, she didn't get it. 
writing for adults and children, I, uh, you know, I, I think the same amount of effort is required. Uh, but certainly uh, the, the craft is um, somewhat different uh, mm -hmm. simply because you recognize that your audience has a certain worldview which may not be able to relate to a grown-up experience, you know. Uh, therefore, everything has to be broken, uh, not dumbed down by any stretch of the imagination. Absolutely. But something that they can sort of relate to. The other thing that I feel as a children's writer and I, I feel... I feel it's an honor to be a part of somebody's childhood, you know, wow. of all the things that you do in your life. If I think about it, the greatest influence on in my life have been, you know, writers that I've read as a child. I mean, I, I grew up with, you know, I mean, my dated Enid Blyton's or whatever, yeah, you know, yeah. but they're, they're in my DNA, you know, right. and, and I think as a children's writer, if you can, if you can, uh, be a part of somebody's growing up, that impression is much deeper than any book you might read, I think, later on in life, you know. So I feel uh, that's a really special job I have. I don't actually think about it, but when I'm writing, I feel that I really want them to be excited, to be interested. And like Sejal said, you know, when you're writing science, when you're writing environment, it's very easy to be an activist. And I really believe that these children are being entirely, they become cookie cutter children, you know, because mm -hmm. everyone has a point of view that they want to impress on them. And I want to say, hey, these are the facts. Do your yeah. research. Use your mind. Think. <laughs> exactly. You know? So uh, that's the kind of books that I, I enjoy writing. To that extent, I'd like to say that was the same fundamental attitude that I would do if I was writing a book for adults. Uh, using different experiences, but basically a similar approach, basically. So, yeah. yeah that's a, I think that's a also, sorry, I didn't mean to. No, no. I mean, it's just lovely that both of you mentioned, I mean, Sejal said that, you know, I mean, because of the kind of reader she is and the attention span that she has, you know, to be able to uh, sort of convey something with a certain simplicity, but also that excitement, mm -hmm. which is almost what you are saying as well, right? I mean, you know, without yeah, dumbing yeah. anything down, but, you know, yeah. uh, understanding the level of that at which your readers are reading, you yeah. are, uh, you know, conveying the same, uh, you know, message. Uh, I mean, you, you are conveying what you want to say, really, right? Go ahead, Sejal. I mean, I just had one corollary question, but go ahead and ask uh, Lubena what you wanted to. Uh... I think what I, as a, uh, just to add to what she said, I think uh, when she said that when you write for children, I think it's a really tough thing actually to now that I think about it, I've written some children's books as well. Mm -hmm. I think it was tougher for me to write for kids than it was to write uh, this book in that sense. I think because uh, as she said, you have to make it appropriate for every age. So when you, mm -hmm. because the science in it cannot be wrong, right? We have to make sure either you're writing for children or you're writing for adults. As writers, your science needs to be bang on. Mm -hmm. Like there can be no mistakes because they are going to use this for the rest of their lives. Yeah, like it's absolutely. going to sit on their shelf. And I think yeah. that um, is very, uh, and I admire that, especially about children's writers, because, uh, see, it's very easy. So when I wrote my first children's book and I wrote one for Pratham, yeah. and then uh, it was so easy to, it's it's so easy to rhyme. When you think about it, you're like, oh, I'll just rhyme a few lines, because in your mind, you're like, <laughs> if I'm writing for kids, I'll just rhyme something. And then, you know, they say, no, no, uh, you, you can't no, do that. No. That's, that's lazy. <laughs> so oh. think harder. And I, I and while you're not, you, you didn't think you're being lazy, you just, that's how you're conditioned. But it's so beautiful yeah. that you have to dig a little deeper and yeah. you need to make it, uh, you cannot treat children, uh, as she said so correctly, it's not dumbing it down. They cannot no. feel that. You have to make it age appropriate in a way that is still very, very exciting to them. And that's where I feel what she said really, it sat with me because yes, that is true. You have to, each age, ke liye, you have to make sure that the science is bang on and yet, you are speaking to them at their level, not below, not above. And I think that is, uh, that's very important. Helps if you have a good editor. 
Yes. Yes. Of course. <laughs> I mean, yes, that's true. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, you know, did uh, did your editor help you come up with the title, Sejal, of the book? Uh, Super no, no, Super Powers was, was in my. Uh, no, no, it was there from the day I started to walk. The before the book became a book, I I was just like every time I was like, oh my god, this is like Superman, this is like Spider Man, this is like so every all of those things had just started from day well, one. I, one end Marvel, you know, universe and one end marvelous universe. So it's all right. <laughs> yes. wow. yeah. Just just to ask you, uh, how easy or difficult was it to adapt, you know, to uh, adapt the theme that you both chose to write about, right? In each of your books, I mean, coastal life, marine life, the interconnectedness of the planet, you know, how easy or difficult was it to do it for you? I mean, I'm asking because we want to see if you took different approaches while writing, uh, you know, uh, for your audiences. Lubena, um, you want to? Uh, yeah, no, go ahead. Start. No, no, I, please go ahead. Go ahead. Take this one. I think, uh, I think um, maybe uh, Sejal might agree with this, is that uh, uh, since we are not scientists, uh, we are basically journalists. Our job has always been to communicate, you know, Correct. Uh, and uh, Therefore, you know, you know uh, that uh, some things are going to, you know, not work uh, mm -hmm. when you're writing, you know, you're, uh, as it is, you know, somewhat editing in your mind about, you know, uh, this will be too technical, this is going to be so this, and then, uh, you know, the key is communication. It's not simplifying. It's being able to bring the wonder of whatever you're doing in an effective manner, and that's basically a communication skill more than anything else i think at least for me but yeah you know uh, i think it helps that i'm not a scientist because all the scientists that i met they're so amazing they have so much to share that they just don't know when to not share you know and i think that's the key in which you know you will say that okay these are the essential elements let me take them because i think this is a good entry point uh, for their discovery, basically. Yeah. But that was for children's books. It's different for adults. I... Sejal, your, your response, yeah. I think what she said about not about being a scientist is really, really important because I think it's very small little things that I think uh, make this a match made in heaven because uh, scientists have so much information. And as she said, like they, they have a lot of it. And they sometimes um, don't know how to make it so when they so to give you an ex a live example i was doing a story on bats there's a roosting side outside my house and through the pandemic i started this really one-sided friendship with them <laughs> with the <laughs> fruit bats and uh i was besotted i was just complete because we couldn't go anywhere and i so for the year i watched them and i did a story on it and i spoke to this wonderful bat scientist uh Bhaitharan, and he <laughs> he said uh you know uh, mama bats in the mornings because the fruit bats babies are really big they, they go to forage and then they all leave their babies in one place and then they come back in the evening and they kind of pick them up. And I said, like a crash. So, and he was, he, he was so delighted. He said, yes, like a crash. Like he had never ever, see, this yeah. is this change in uh, this thing because he was so delighted with that. And to me, it was the most obvious thing that mamas are leaving yeah. babies in one place and mamas are coming to pick them up. Yeah. So to me, it was like, so I think it's these so things that I was just delighted yeah with when I spoke to scientists because that wonder and I have to say that every you know the myth of the non-communicative and communicative scientist is not I haven't found it because each scientist I spoke to was unabashedly in love with their subjects yeah and they were, very very true. Like they were lyrical in their love for them so yeah. there was the eyes would light up and they would yeah. make these beautiful poetic references and I'm just yeah. you know I'm like all of y'all should write because you, you know, we need more science writers out here. And if you are a scientist yourself, you must, you must write. Because, and that I think was a wonderful sort of thread that comes together when a non-scientist and a scientist. So for example, Abhishek Jamalabad, who features very prominently mm -hmm. in the book, one of the founders of the Marine Life of Mumbai Collective, he was That's talking right. about the depths of the ocean at which sunlight does not uh, reach beyond. So he said, mm -hmm. a scientist will tell you that thousand meters below the sea, this thing, sunlight does not move. And I was like, oh, okay, but that's a fact. But then he said, and he's got this, he's the one of those people who have this rare skill of being on both sides, communication and science. And he said, do you understand what that means? It means that below this level, 
exists an entire civilization of creatures that does not know the existence of a sun like something that makes our lives you know what it what they are and we are all alive there are entire generation and civilization of creatures who live in darkness who don't know that a sun is there. and just that it's the same thing but it's a shift in my mind i was like yes that's true yeah. so i think it's these moments i think that make this kind of writing truly exciting because yeah. uh, it gives it gives you a it's a lovely sort of match i don't think one can do it without the other or maybe they can you know some of them are freaks and they can do this so <laughs> some of them have super yeah. powers yeah. about how uh, you know uh, they sort of get uh, energized when you're talking about uh, any you know their field of uh, study yes uh, and the smaller the creature the more excited they are <laughs> the smaller the creature the more excited they are like are kon aaya hai isko chhota sa thing ko dekhne ke liye they're so delighted <laughs> it was just lovely because you there's so much interest they're so happy that yeah. uh, it needs to get out there and they're just yeah. uh, your yeah that's that's it, it's very fun i i yeah. i found that the best and most rewarding part of the of the book yeah. was really lovely fun. lovely uh, responses really i mean you know that whole thing about uh, guys hit your science textbooks kind of thing right immediately i mean the writers yeah. have the superpowers that's what it is yeah. really from yeah. the answers i'm not uh, you know uh, you know not taking away anything from the scientists but you know look at how yeah. wonderfully the yeah. two of you have managed to convey uh, you know what you uh, you know We what you have the communicators they are the guys yeah. who knows who have everything yeah. it's very sometimes very annoying i'm like what why can't i just like download all this information in my brain because there's so much <laughs> that they know and sometimes i think in approaches and with yeah this is also something i found is that sometimes as uh, because we are not scientists uh, it's really essential the research is so essential like i've, I've like literally cried myself to sleep sometimes because i think yes you can communicate with scientists and you can talk to them and they have this whole bucket of information but sometimes we might not know uh, which question we have not asked because yeah. we don't know about it at all yeah. like if it comes out in conversation that's great but that whole fear of like what if um, you know i just yes uh, exact for more in that sense okay, what is FOMO. what if i have not known only to ask this question Getting. so i think over a period of time when we take our take our time to write the books i think you kind of cover all your bases but that that fear i think of uh, and that i think as scientists i think it's just a that's why i said it's just a one i don't think one can do it without the other because sometimes you just ask leading questions and then when they get comfortable they're also in that flow where they said oh do you know ye bhi hota hai do you know this also happens and i think that uh, but i think it's a it, that is a to me that was a bit bit of a worry worry point for me what if i miss out on some things or what if i something and sometimes translation also lo ben i don't think i don't know if you had this issue no, but sometimes when we try to say difficult things in simple languages uh, in uh, in a simple way um, i think that i was also afraid that some we may make something sound too simplistic too simple um, yeah. simple it's you no know, simple is okay but what if it becomes simplistic in in the way we yeah. put it so i think there's a lot of back and forth and i mean i think we'll both agree that when books are easy to read i think they are really tough to write yeah so, of course i think that is that is uh, that's the thing that we sort of write but i want to tell you something you should take a leaf out of a marvel and always leave a little something for the sequel <laughs> for the sequel <laughs> you know not just sequel prequels whatever yeah, yeah, prequels. Everything, everything. <laughs> origin yeah, stories what are it is there like <laughs> wow that's good cool. lovely lovely mm. lovely uh, you know responses so so one of the you know one uh, it, it's it's that time of the year in fact our whole conversation at glf began with saying that what we should do something that focuses on the monsoons and i know that you ladies are right now you know it's raining cats and dogs or you know uh, molasses in your city at the moment i think really also here in bangalore um you know why could you conjure up some images uh, you know for our viewers on the monsoon on marine life on the coasts and how vital this connection really is uh, you know for our planet i'm going to let seja start with that because i have you know something different to say so okay um, and i i don't know much about you know mumbai's marine life as yet <laughs> 
Do so I'm a big it. fan of the, I mean, I, if you read the book, I think uh, in the intro itself, I mean, um, I have very fond memories of the rains. I, my, when everybody used to, I mean, Bombay's monsoon means business, you know, it's not something that <laughs> yeah, doesn't take its job lightly at all. <laughs> it's like, yeah. always, so I lived in Bangalore, Vidya, for a, for a bit, and I always had, used to make, you know, we used to have a little bit of a, uh, fun uh, back and forth with the local <laughs> friends there because they would be like, oh, barish ho hai. And I'm like, I mean, please, like, you know. <laughs> like, go. She said, like, take an umbrella. And I was like, guys, like, just like, control yourselves. You know, like, bomb. I, I found Bangalore's rain very polite. Like, it would come, like, thoda thoda. It could come when everybody's gone home. And uh, Bombay's rain, if you step out, the rain is like, oh my God, you've got out. Now you see. Laura put it like, Tumari majal ke tum bahar nikle. Like, it's, it takes it very personally and it just like sort of comes down on you. you know, uh, I love it. I uh, I absolutely love, I've grown up in Bombay. I'm a Bombay girl. And I, um, when I was very young, uh, my father, who is no more, uh, used to take a bunch of us to the beach. And uh, while the rain pelted down uh, on everyone, we just formed like this human chain and let the waves do, you know, work their magic on us. And I think we, ha I have these really strong memories of the intertidal, which ironic as it is, my father introduced me to all those years ago. Hmm. But I think uh, to me now, Marine Mumbai's monsoon over the last four years has really changed because yeah. to me, this means the arrival of the um, intertidal um, Beautiful creatures, uh, which you will see on most coastal beaches, is the Portuguese man of war. Yeah. Um, if you haven't seen it, you should definitely look it up because it is one of the Your most kids beautiful used to dreams. call it the blue bottle. Is that the same thing? The blue bottle, yes, yes, yeah. Rubena, That's exactly what it is. It is a um, cousin of the jellyfish uh, the family. Jellyfish. It's uh, part of. Though it is not a jellyfish. It's part of the. It's mistaken for a jellyfish because it can sting. And mm -hmm. um, our beaches are littered with them. They get stranded yeah. in the rains. So actually, even fishers. Um, and that's the beautiful interconnectedness that the monsoon has, right? The blue bottles. Before the blue bottles, the blue buttons come. So they are like little mm -hmm. white discs, like 10 rupee coins, wala discs. And they yeah. have these tentacles that come out like the sun. I mean, and the blue uh, bottles then, description in your book is yeah. just so fantastic, it's really. Like they right? are so beautiful. And they are just scattered all over. And the blue buttons are not as, I mean, the sting is not as powerful. But as they start coming in, the fishers start to know that, you know, the monsoon is going to be here. So they come before the rains come, say around nice. May, late May, early June is when they start arriving. That's when the fishers know now you need to pull your boats in. And oh. then uh, the blue bottles come after that, which are those gas chambers type of things with those <laughs> glorious long tentacles. And uh, they come and they are deeply, like they're deeply venomous. So, you know, you should observe them from afar, but uh, you should definitely go say hi to them because they're... So to me, I think monsoon has now, you know, taken this kind of anticipation. I haven't seen them this year, and uh, it's mm -hmm. it's been it's in my head that I haven't seen. So this is what also writing does to you, right? I think you, uh, your associations um, change or uh, not change. They just become a little more inclusive. I think there's a lot more now that you think of. You think, ha, fishers ne, this is the tide, oh, tide high. Uh, like fishers have now pulled back. There's so much about your city that you start to understand the seasons, how they affect things. Now, we also see the tarballs come in, uh, thrash mm -hmm. comes in before the mm -hmm. Ganpati will go again, the beach will be. So, you know, these are the associations that start to now, uh, start to form once you start walking uh, on the coast. So, yeah, I, I can continue to talk about the rain. So, Lubaina, please. Don't go. <laughs> I grew up in Hyderabad and I spent my summers here with my grandparents here in Mumbai. And... Uh, I knew that when we used to go to Juhu Beach and the little blue bottles showed up, it was time for the holidays to end and go back home. So that was that was our thing, you know. And we were like, oh, blue bottle, it's going to sting us. And we used to run, you know, that sort of thing. Then, of course, now I live here in Mumbai. And uh, then it was all about buttas on Marine Drive while getting splashed by the monsoon, you know. Uh, that's, that's like a thing you're supposed to do. Um, last four years, five years, now, of course, last two years, I don't, I don't go anywhere near the ocean. First of all, oh. because there was the, you know, the pandemic, and then after that, yes. there's this coastal road that's coming up, uh, and uh, all of that has been sort of huge amounts of lands have been encroached. So the ocean is like in the distance. Oh, so really? I don't really know what's going on there. But just before the coastal road thing happened, the two years that we started going, there would be these 
massive waves that would wash up on Marine Drive and leave behind at least about half a kilometer of trash. Wow. Time, you know, <laughs> and and then that, that was like a wake up call. It's like the, the sea is saying, take it back. I don't want it. You know, yeah. you just uh -huh. throw it it. Here, and I'm just going to throw it back to you. So where there's really in my part of Mumbai, where the sea was so special in the monsoon, like, you know, Sejal says, I mean, the monsoon is, and I don't know what is wrong with us. We always step out without umbrellas in Bombay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. It's like, a, you know, it's a monsoons come every year since time immemorial. But you just find people running under trees in Bombay. <laughs> So, it was really special so when time. I think it's just us. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I think it's like, no, no, I mean, under the tree, there's like a jamaat, you know, like, it's like, <laughs> so, that's, that's basically the thing. And then this, when this plastic started coming and then <clears throat> there would be tons of garbage trucks trying to clean that up. And it was a bit heartbreaking, I would say. Mm. And it's, it's, you know, I don't know what would happen to the creatures that came up with the tide, you know, mm. caught in all of that trash. But, uh, and now the sea is so far away, so I don't know what's happening. But certainly it started, uh, you know, making sense to me that, listen, you know, this world is a closed loop. Nothing you throw is going away. It's going to come back to you, yeah. you know. <laughs> and that is really something that that conversation needs to happen. If we care about the creatures... First, let's make sure that we let them have a peaceful habitat to live in, you know. Then That's hopefully true. we'll see more of the creatures that come in the monsoons, you know. Um, I'm hoping that will happen. Children are becoming more aware. Uh, they are having conversations in school. They are uh, aware about, you know, recycling and things. Uh, maybe a couple years down the line, we'll find the little blue bottles again in the beach and not the, <laughs> you know, bags, basically. <laughs> Lovely. Keeping fingers crossed, uh, really, that that happens, you know. <laughs> it was just a lovely, lovely conversation. It ebbed and flowed much <laughs> like uh, you know, the waters in your intertidal, uh, you know, zones. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, you know, uh, in this conversation on India's coastal zones. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with the two of you today. And uh, we really you know i'm going away thinking that the superpowers are with the writers really that's just what it is uh, and it's writers like the two of you who make us feel that way thank you so much for joining us today um we're looking forward to many many more conversations with you going forward yeah thank, thank you, you so much thank you Lubena. thank you for being Bye. superb i love women panels for this this reason <laughs> <laughs> thank all you. right bye then Thank um, you.